Hey, I brought a prop. Learning without limits and what if. Um, behind me is the uh, Twitter feed, at SoupMonomidae, and I hope some of you will want to follow me. One of the things in education I think we have to do is a breakthrough. And the breakthrough I think that are going to be coming are going to be space and time. And Twitter is something that actually helps with both of those, as is what's in the box. The thing about space and time with education is, is that if you have a lot of followers on Twitter, you can tweet something out and say, can you help me find out about? Or does anybody know anything? Or is there a good professional article I should be reading? And your followers will tweet back. I used to think when I was a kid, and I'm sad to say you'll be hearing me say when I was a kid a lot in this presentation, but when I was a kid, I used to think that all of the knowledge resided in one place. That was at the school. That was in the library, and it was in the person of my teacher. And then one glorious day, little third grade Mark came home from school, and what did he find? But a box of encyclopedias. And this thing changed space and time. I don't have encyclopedias in here, I have an actual time machine. <laughs> I don't, but wouldn't it be cool? It really would. Um, I do have the encyclopedias of my youth in here. And it's amazing. I can't let them go. When I came home as a third grader, this bigger box than this, I couldn't carry more than that, was in our living room. And I asked my mom, you know, is that for me? Well, you wait till your sister gets home. Oh, that's for both of us. And, uh, but I remember opening it up and being excited. And many of you probably know that Aardvark is the first entry in the encyclopedias. But it's just so great. This, to me, represented the change in space and time. When my dad came home from work that day, he said to me, you know, pretty much all the information in the world is in that box. And I remember thinking about it and thinking, yeah, that's true. Anything that I'd want to find out is right here. It's in that box. And I'm embarrassed about this slide up here because this box of encyclopedias was in our basement under a bunch of camping stuff that I had forgotten all about. I'd even forgotten to fight with my sister to get it until I was cleaning up some stuff during spring break. But I can't let it go. And I don't know why I can't. We'll come back to that. Education needs to continually evolve and make changes and get better. And we've done that through a whole bunch of different things. A lot of times it's been some tweaking and some evolving. Chalkboard, blackboard, very exciting innovation. My first teaching gig, the blackboard, I use it like everyone else. One side, you know, let's do that day. Middle, notes, and then on the far side, stuff, stuff coming up. Uh, test on Friday, uh, paper due next week, that type of thing. I use it in an innovative way. I let the kids who are well behaved clap the erasers at the end. <laughs> The next teaching job I had, we had the whiteboard. Same thing, except a little bit different, a tweak and an improvement again, continuous improvement. One of the crusty old social studies teachers, as if there's any other kind, said to me, the great thing about this is that you don't have to pull the screen down when you show your film strip. <laughs> Those of you who don't know what a film strip is, you can encyclopedia it. <laughs> I also use it in an innovative way. Um, the kids who are well-behaved, I let them sniff the markers. <laughs> you know, in hindsight, that doesn't sound like a good idea, does it? Okay. And now we have smart boards. But the thing is, is that we're continually getting better, and we're evolving, and we're doing things that are making a difference for kids. Teaching is better, learning is better. But these are things that we're using. What about programs that we have? Well, Matamita has been known as a STEM school. And STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, S-T-E-M. I've never been a big STEM guy, not because I was a former English teacher, but because it seemed pretty much prescriptive, and I didn't really like that. I had some people say to me things like, you know, the problem with STEM is that science, and scientists are all test tubes and beakers, and there's no creativity. You need to have creativity. Or they would say, you know, mathematicians, they're all pocket protectors and slide rules. There's no creativity there. In order to improve this, you just need to add steam. And that would be science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And I like this even less. <laughs> because what I think it does is it makes art appear to be the only time you're creative. You need to be creative all the time. And you can't have things be that prescriptive. Prescriptive education doesn't always work real well. 
It should be a little bit messy. And the thing when you look at this, science, technology, engineering, art, and math, you should drop those other parts and focus on the engineering. Engineers create, they develop, they invent things, they access and analyze information, they put it together in unique ways, and they use the tools that they have. A little bit messy, but they'll use the tools. And that's what I think we have to do with education. Or else we're like this. We're going to be in some kind of box. And A, no one puts baby in a corner. And B, he doesn't look any too happy. <laughs> so the answer really clearly is engineering. You use biology when that's appropriate and not chemistry. You use geometry when you should and not calculus. You don't try to force into a formula all of these things. It's got to be a little bit more like this. Now, I was embarrassed about the uh, encyclopedias in our basement, and this is actually our junk drawer. I did clean it up a little bit, trying to impress you. Um, but the point that I want to make on this is that all the stuff in here is what we need to do with education. We need to provide tools and allow people the chance to use those tools. We have a kitchen island, and we're trying to figure out if we should get new stools. Well, we're not going to use the screwdriver to figure out the height of the stools. We'll use the tape measure. We're not going to force something to make something else work. We got that little fireplace clicker thing in there underneath the tape measure. We're not going to use the pliers to start the fireplace. We're not going to use tape when we should be using the pencil sharpener. Education is a little bit messy, and it needs to provide the tools. And that's what it is. It's a little bit of a junk drawer. But before we go a little bit to the future, I want to go back to the past a little bit. A lot of you know who this is. And if you don't know who it is, let me give you some facts about him. 56-game hitting streak, World Series MVP, most valuable player, um, married Marilyn Monroe. Those type of things make it so you don't have to encyclopedia him. You actually would Google him. And this is Joe DiMaggio. His nickname was the Yankee Clipper. And the reason why he was called the Yankee Clipper was because of the gracefulness of the Clipper ships. The Clipper ships were tall and graceful and wonderful in so many ways. This is an example of one. A whole bunch of sails up way high. I'm not sure why. Are those four sails out front? I don't know if they're jib sails, spinnakers. I don't know what they are. But the thing is, is that they took the wind and was going to constantly improve it. And they tweaked, and they improved, and they made things better. But the problem with tweaking and continuous improvement and making things better is you miss the breakthrough. Now, I pulled this picture off the internet. I don't know if this boat is going forward or backward. I'm pretty sure it's not powered by steam. It might be powered by solar. It could be nuclear. It could be hydrogen. It could be gas. I have no idea. But I know that if you only worked on the wind, you would miss the breakthrough. And I think in education, we need to look at the breakthrough. And I think the breakthrough, as I mentioned, is space and time. And I think that's where we've got to go and think about that. So how do we make this with learning without limits? All of these things are important that we learn, that we develop, that we invent, that we create, and that we have all of this stuff that comes in to help the students achieve as much as they can. And the most important one is coming in at the bottom, curiosity and imagination. Now, I was putting this slide together. I thought that I would have these things come in, you know, just like the stem and steam, one at a time like that. And I wanted to give you a visual image to make it appear as if it was a little bit more chaotic. And they were coming in from different ways, because I think that's what education has to be. It's not going to be all that linear. It's going to be a little bit unique. And as we look at space and time and the constraints that they have and trying to get to the limits, I think this is where we're going to have to go. And these are the learning without limit skills that we need. But let me go back to a couple other things. When I was a kid, schools were largely all things to all people. I vividly remember my third grade experience, not just from the encyclopedia, but being called up to the front of the desk at the front of the teacher's desk. There was this telephone there. It was one of those black rotary ones, a rotary dial for those of you who don't know. It's you put your number in this little thing, you spin it around, it goes back. Okay, you got, some of you do know? Okay, good. Oh, and I hated all those nines. I had so much work. Um, so anyway, she would say, ring, ring. And I would pick up the phone, I would say, hello, Larson residence, Mark speaking. And I would get graded on that. Did I have proper inflection? Did I announce to the caller the number that they had reached? Did I let the caller know who they were talking to? I have no idea why Bloomington schools felt it was their obligation to teach me how to answer the phone, <laughs> but they did. <laughs> Likewise, I have no idea why the public education system thought it was their responsibility to teach me how to drive, but they did. And really, I have no idea why they made me watch all those horrid driver's ed films, oh, but they did. I don't think that's where we can be. I think this is an unsustainable model. But I don't think we want to be here either. 
Some of the elite private schools are all things to a few people. It's a narrow niche. If you, some of them are boarding schools, and so they'll provide room. They'll provide board. They'll provide everything, connections, mentoring. And it's for a select few people. Public education takes all. We're taking everybody. So I don't think we can be there. Likewise, I don't think we can be in this bottom box. I don't think we can be a few things to a few people. And those are like the testing companies, the ACT prep tests or the SAT or the LSAT or GRE. I mean, those are things that will provide a narrow opportunity for you. You want to have your kid get a better score on this? Hire this tutor to help them with test taking strategies or something. I don't think we want to be there either. I think where we want to be is in this box, the few things to all people box. But here's the problem. What are those few things? And what is this monkey doing on the screen? <laughs> or in front of you? Um, this is a monkey from the Tonkin Bay area of Vietnam. It's called a Tonkin monkey. And they're also called snub-nosed Tonkin monkeys. And you, you can either encyclopedia it or Google it to find out. The problem with the Tonkin monkey is that researchers could not capture the monkey. Uh, apparently, they're very clever. And so what they did is they put the nuts from a beetle palm tree in a glass jar. The monkey reached its hand in, clenched the nuts, and could not get its arm out. Lugging around a big jar was apparently easy to catch a monkey in the jungle. <laughs> Why wouldn't the monkey let go? I mean, all it had to do was let go of the nuts, tip it over, pick them up, and eat them. Why didn't I let go of the encyclopedias? What are we holding on to that we shouldn't be, that we have to let go of? And so I think that's where we have to be. What if? And what if we let go of some things? We don't teach kids how to text message, and yet they seem to figure it out pretty well on their own. Are there some things that we have to let go of? And what are those things? And what if we look at learning without limits? It's a little bit messy. We have to get through some of the space and time issues and thoughts. And we ask, what if? What if school didn't fit in a box like this? And it wasn't a box of September to June, 8 AM to 2.30. But the box was beyond that. And then finally, what if we replenish our own box? Not with tweeting or texting or other stuff, but dumped out the encyclopedias and the other things and replenished our box with the things. Am I creating a problem here, Patrick, with the clicker? Sorry about that. Um, well, and then what if we replenished our box with a few things to all people with breakthroughs? Thank you.